Aha! Scholar Gladiator, Matt Easton here, and um, previously I did a video talking about the boarding axe, but it just so happens that uh, this isn't a boarding axe, incidentally, it's just an axe. I don't own a boarding axe, so this is to represent a boarding axe. Um, but it just so happens that a wonderful resource has just been shared with the community um, by Nick, Esther, and Alex over at the AHF, um, the Academy of Historical Fencing. And you guys know them, I'm sure you know Nick's channel. And and the AHF is, uh, channel, uh, they've been around for years, uh, pretty much as long as my channel has been. Um, and, uh, you know, I know Nick, I've known Nick for many years, and they're doing great stuff over there. They're great guys. It's nice to meet up with them at events and all that kind of stuff. Uh, they, of course, focus largely, not entirely, but largely on Georgian era British sources, naval and military so Navy and Army, um, and I tend to focus on Victorian stuff, and we both do some medieval and Renaissance stuff as well. But uh, the point is that they have just shared a, a very, um, a, a, let's say, a treatise or a manual which has uh, a, achieved a lot of interest over the last few years because it's quite enigmatic. And it is by a certain William Pringle Green, who was a naval officer during the Napoleonic Wars. And in 1812, he published a manual on how he thought that um, sailors and marines, other people on board ships, should fight, uh, particularly in close action. Now, this manual deals with um, how they should be equipped, how they should be coordinated in terms of kind of like group fighting, and it has a, a little bit of detail on individual combat as well. Now, this uh, treatise is actually um, owned by the uh, Royal Maritime um, Museum collection, and it's not in public domain, but the images from it are usable for educational purposes. So that's exactly what Nick, Esther, and Alex have done, is they've transcribed the original manual into modern English as much as possible. Uh, there's a few words, I've read through it quickly, and there are a few words in there which it wasn't uh, possible to transcribe because they were written in uh, handwriting and they were unintelligible. Um, but by and large, it's fully readable um, and understandable. And it's a really, really fascinating manual. And it's one of those rare examples of a uh, treatise which isn't written officially you know it's not an official manual by by the uh, by the government um, or the war department and equally it's not a manual by a fencing master as well it's someone who has experience of actual combat on board ships during wartime now um so first of all the link is below this video to, to that and go and check it out it's really really interesting it makes a really interesting read um and the uh, there are a few things in there which are quite uh, interesting uh, in terms of how the weapons are used. First thing, as I mentioned in my previous video on the boarding axe, the boarding axe is not mentioned at all in the manual. Now that does seem to be um, because in, at least in the Royal Navy, in the British, um, in the British Navy, the boarding axe was not largely seen as a weapon. That's not to say it wasn't seen as a weapon at all. Um, I have seen them described amongst lists of weapons since I've been doing a bit more research on the topic. Um, but it does seem that they weren't primarily seen as a weapon, they were primarily seen as a tool. Of course, tools often get used as weapons, and in fact, in my previous video, I showed some images, and in some of those images, axes are being used in close combat, but equally so are brooms and other random objects on board the ship, so everything to hand, basically. Um, but that being said, they're not considered in uh, William Pringle Green's treaties as a weapon. He primarily talks about the uh, cutlass, uh, the pistol, um, the musket and bayonet, and I believe the boarding pike, although I haven't seen that bit yet. Um, and um, these are the primary weapons, at least, of the British um, seamen. Uh, the cutlass and the pistol are the primary weapons, um, and as well as, co uh, 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 of course, as the actual ship and the artillery on board the ship, um, the large guns and such like, uh, and of course missile weapons, they're very, very important, of which the pistol is one, but the pistol is a close-in missile weapon rather than a long-range missile weapon. Um, and you'll see there are some very interesting techniques in there, and I'm just going to show you one for the purposes of this video. You can go away and look at it yourself. So I did mention about the fact that the pistol, uh, either one 
once discharged or potentially even before it's discharged is um, used in particular defensive ways in William Pringle Green's treaties. Um, now one thing he does say about discharging the pistol is he says that the standard doctrine in the Royal Navy during the Napoleonic Wars was when you're boarding you take your pistol in your right hand and as you're boarding you fire it at the enemy and then you throw away the pistol. I'm not going to throw away this because it's a quite valuable antique but you throw away the pistol and then you draw out your cutlass and charge into combat and he says there's a much better way of doing this what he thinks is better is because because you're shooting at some range your chances of hitting or wounding anyone are less you're more likely to miss should we say or you stand a large chance of missing um, but additionally, uh, the, you've got the problem of then shooting at someone whilst you're boarding, then throwing away the pistol whilst you're still boarding, then struggling to get your cutlass out whilst you're still boarding and they're potentially attacking you with boarding pikes or bayonets or whatever. So what he says a better idea to do is you take your pistol and you shove it into your sash or your belt and you charge aboard with your cutlass in your right hand. And once you've got on board safely and got to close range, only at that point do you pull the pistol out with your left hand and once you're at basically point blank range you discharge it straight into the enemy uh, formation where you stand almost no chance of missing you're going to hit someone and of course you've got your cutlass ready to defend yourself now once this has been discharged he does use it as a parrying device and it's very interesting how he does it what he does is he holds the pistol backwards like this and he shows as a head guard he shows if you're taking essentially a recruit and you're teaching them how to defend from the most common blow and he says most untutored people he says the only good cut that they can do is a downwards cut at the head this is the thing that most people would do so he says the first thing you want to teach people is you want to teach them to stick their sword above their head and the pistol above the head like that so basically you cover this and you're pretty much covering everything towards your vital targets um, and having done that having taken the blow wherever it may land then you can of course uh, repost or reply as you see fit and take out the opponent so it's a very very interesting and practical manual um, and um, I highly recommend you to go and take a look at it it has a lot of the sorts of quite simplistic actually but quite simple uh, advice combat advice that you wouldn't find in a more traditional kind of fencing manual Finally, I just want to mention boarding axes again. So, uh, coming out of the last video I did talking about boarding axes, I made a big thing about the fact that boarding axes across the board are tools rather than weapons. Well, I want to qualify that point slightly. So, I went away, um, various people contacted me about this, um, particularly French-speaking people. Um, and others as well but I went away and researched this uh, in British sources and I also looked at some of the, the um, some of the French language sources as well that were shared with me um, the principal person incidentally who was instrumental in pointing this out to me was Maxime Chouinard who uh, I think I've probably butchered your name there but Max anyway uh, in Canada and um, he is much more familiar with French sources than I am now an interesting thing is that obviously when I talk about cutlasses or axes or whatever I'm primarily relying on English language sources not always British sometimes American Canadian Australian whatever but generally speaking I'm talking about British sources and admittedly sometimes in history we find that the uh, the perspective of a different nationality may be different and this is one of those cases so it does seem that axes boarding axes which come in various different forms usually they have a spike on the back uh, sometimes they have a hammer on the back but it does seem that they were regarded as fighting weapons in some other countries particularly in the French Navy and possibly in the Spanish Navy as well um, and of course in certainly in the Napoleonic period probably you could say the three most important navies in the world were the British Navy the French Navy and the Spanish Navy look at the Battle of Trafalgar uh, for example um, so you know, we should take those other perspectives into, into, um, into view and into consideration. So therefore, I'm going to, uh, for those of you who love axes, uh, I'm now throwing you something back uh, to say, well, you know what? They may not have been massively taken seriously as weapons in British circles, but it does seem that they were in other, particularly French and Spanish, and it does seem in America as well, they were more considered as a serious weapon. Why this was... Uh, a difference? I don't know. It does seem that the Royal Navy was always very keen on its cutlasses. Um, 
It's not that the French Navy didn't have plenty of cutlasses, they did. It is possible that in America, uh, certainly in the kind of um, in the early 19th century and the 18th century, it is possible that in America cutlasses were harder to come by uh, because they weren't made locally for the most part, they were made abroad and imported in. It is possible that for that reason axes were perhaps used in the American Navy a little bit more because they didn't have as access to as many cutlasses. That doesn't stand up as an argument for the French uh, because of course the French had plenty of cutlasses. Uh, but the other thing to say finally about the boarding axe is the boarding axe wasn't only used to chop up rigging and, and wood and stuff and chop your way into holes and through doors and that kind of stuff. The spike on, or, or indeed, or, or to fight, just to fight with. The spike on the back, interestingly, was used um, famously so, and it's even described in dictionaries in, in some languages in this way, for climbing up ships. That's right. So if we look at a climbing axe, uh, for mountaineering or you know rock climbing, uh, it does seem that these were used a little bit like that, and they would literally take the boarding axe and they would smack the uh, spike end. Obviously, this doesn't have a spike because so it's not a boarding axe, but they'd stack, stick the spike end into the side of the ship, get a few of them, and that would enable people to climb up the side of the ship. Uh, which, of course, boarding axe. It's an axe for boarding. Uh, so just because the act of boarding involves fighting you have still got to board. You've got to get on board the enemy ship in order to fight the people on it. So an implement where, you know, if you take one of each of these, an implement where you can smack the spike into the side of a, a ship and your uh, mates do the same thing and then you can climb up and go on board with the cutlass or the pistol is, is a good object to have. Uh, so a good all-round implement. So. To summarise, <laughs> to finish off, um, I do highly recommend you go and look at William Pringle Green's um, treatise. It's fascinating stuff and it's really, really different to the majority of what we have when it comes to fighting combat manuals. And it's a fascinating period. It dates to 1812, so for those of you, of course, the War of 1812 um, in America. Pr William Pringle Green, incidentally, although he served in the Royal Navy, was a Canadian as well. So, uh, so it has Canadian interest, you know, kind of New World interest. The War of 1812, the Napoleonic Wars, it's a fascinating period, fascinating weapons. And the other thing to mention is, as well, often I encounter, because I'm interested in the 19th century, um, a lot of people go, oh, well, you know, um, guns were, were the most important weapons in the 19th century, which of course they were. Um, but hand-to-hand -hand combat did still happen a lot in the 19th century and in the 18th century. And one interesting thing is that when we look at naval combat, it does seem that, by and large, obviously most na naval combat is ships shooting at each other, but in boarding actions, in fact, these close combat weapons become incredibly important because in order to take a ship, you have to go on board it. And you can't just stand there and shoot, you have to physically get on board. And it's one of the reasons why the cutlass was such an important weapon for the Navy, for, for most navies around the world until the beginning of the uh, 20th century, and they were still training single stick and cutlass drill until World War I, quite it, it, widespread. Um, anyway, I hope that's useful and interesting. Uh, give us a like and a subscribe if you've never done that before, um, and um, uh, extra videos on Patreon. I will see you soon for another new video, and take care, folks. Thanks for watching. We've got extra videos on Patreon. Please give our Facebook a like and subscribe if you haven't already. Cheers, folks.